Hey, it's time for me to share what my feedback, if you like, uh, from watching Gabor Mate and uh, Prince Harry. And I, I got quite a lot of notes <laughs> while I was watching. I was surprised. I got my notepad and pen ready just in case that, you know, to write something down. But there was so much wisdom in there. There was so much truth. There, there was, it was so raw, so authentic. It wasn't staged. Um, it was just amazing. Instead of seeing... I mean, Dr. Gabor Mate was sat there very much in his role as a Gabor Mate. <laughs> but at some point during the, the interview, you saw past his role and you saw him as a soul there. So he'd, he'd be like in his, I am the interviewer, I am the, the therapist kind of role. And with the questions. And, but he also shared his own vulnerability and his own rawness and his own authenticity. And it, it was a beautiful thing to see, a beautiful thing to bear witness to, as was Harry's. Because here, instead of seeing the choked up guy who was rigid and trying to play the game and look like a fish out of water, which is what I'd witnessed whenever I'd seen him in anything apart from when he was at work, when there was films or videos or bits and pieces where he was um, in his work, work environment, where he actually felt, looked, well, he looked more at home than anything else, and he touched on that in the talk. So I was, I was really amazed to see him sitting comfortably and he was eager for and excited by the conversation although at first there was the little initial nerves which absolutely anyone would have whether he was Harry or Gabor Mate or you know no matter who you are even in my time working with people who work on stage, you know, um, and are public figures, they still have that bit of something before they go on stage because they want to, they want to make the most of it, they want to do what's right and they don't want to screw up, you know, and... Here was Harry looking like a young man. He was quite comfortable and very, very knowledgeable on, on grief, on trauma, on uh, Just like, I want to say PTSD, but as he said, it's language and PTSD is not a disorder. And telling people it's a disorder, you know, it's the language. It's like depression. They, him and Gabon both said, depression, it, it tells you there's something wrong with you. It's an illness. And they're treating, people treat things like an illness, like there's something up. And they were saying that the... the and I, I agree fully, the issue with the medical profession um, and as Gabor said, the, the way that people are letting down humanity, the way that m more than people, GPs, general practitioners and people within 
the the medical schools the, the universities within the the hospitals the way that they let people down is because they they forget they or or worse than forget they they just don't acknowledge that that any form of health condition has more than just the mind uh, or it's more than just the thing that they see and they treat these things that come up with um pharmaceutical things instead of medicine and i'd put a, a thing here a note which i'm sure i'll find eventually and it was um medicines come from the earth that change your perception and promote healing so so natural medicines promote healing whereas pharmaceutical type stuff it it just helps the symptoms it doesn't serve by helping the root cause and they don't acknowledge the fact that the mind body and spirit are connected and that's one of the things that when it comes to trauma um, and depression, depression means it is the suppression of feelings and eventually you get depressed and your feelings are suppressed. You suppress things for too long. So in all these things, you've, in, in my medicine, my mama bear medicine, in, in indigenous medicines for alternative practitioners and holistic practitioners, Usually, you don't look at it as we're going to treat the symptoms. It's we look for a root cause. That's that's why I do the the science and uh, spirituality, the science and shamanism. It's integrated because what you're doing is you're looking at what science tells you, what the the research tells you what different things have told you, what statistics have told you, how things work physio physiologically, and you you take into mind the the mind and the body and the spirit of the person to find an overall balance and overall solution, one that's longer lasting. That's what doesn't happen today. All this kind of thing got talked about and it, it was like a breath of fresh air. And often for me, Gabo Mate is a breath of fresh air. Uh, so is Bruce Lipton, Dr. Michael Beckwith, um, Dr. Alberto Valdo. And for people that think that it's all a bit Woohoo, voodoo kind of thing. We're now at this stage where science is proving that there's a lot more science that's supporting this kind of thing, like the, the meridian system and things. There's so much science that supports t um, like EFT, which is emotional freedom technique, which is your tapping. The, there's so much science now which which proves genetics and thing was all wrong that's Bruce Lipton he proved that genetics um and he'd gone out of his way and proved that genetics existed and he had to disprove all what he proved in the first place and then he came up with epigenetics and epigenetics is what we're we're studying now that is like at the forefront of medicine and again, in the forefront of medicine, especially um, psychotherapy um, and treatment of the mind for trauma um, and grief and things is cognitive and behavioural therapies because you're bringing in the mind, you're bringing in the body, you're looking at the way we move, the way that we talk, the way that we think, the way that we interact with our world which is why um, why I, I do a lot of my studies with NICAM. So it's the, it is the, at the forefront, it is proven that 
like what they were saying about yesterday, that it goes further than just the basics of, oh, it's, it's all right, we'll fix it with a pill. Because they're saying that really the, you need a whole host of different tools to heal. Prince Harry, or Harry, he had five different methods of, of healing that really stuck out. And it was, was meditation, um, therapy, like talking therapy, getting out in nature and psychedelics did I say oh and relationships they're all the the different things for him that really stuck out so his relationship with M Megan Mian whatever her name is um that enabled him to have the support system in place to really look at himself and turn inward and to look at ways to change himself and to better himself as a father and as a husband um, and as a family member. He'd all, I mean, over the years, he's done a hell of a lot of things like creating the Invictus Games and helping people that are disabled, helping people with mental health, helping people with grief. I mean, not many people don't know about Princess Diana, his mum. And that was a hard thing for any 12-year-old boy to deal with, but especially in the public eye. So, so it's really interesting to see how he'd gone from someone who never really experienced touch um, and was in that kind of very stiff upper lip British upbringing and the, the personal traumas that he experienced and how he's gone to to now and how he's incredibly conscious um so he's incredibly aware of him of himself of his feelings and how he interacts with others um and of how his behavior his actions and behavior his thoughts as well how that affects his children and the people in his space it's really interesting to see his his thoughts on on grief and grieving and he was saying how he recognizes that we're all connected through grief all of us he's he's, he, he's aware of the interconnectedness of everything he wants to remove the stigma for mental health and that mental health carries because so many people think you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't say this or do that or you should be ashamed or you've got to hide it. And he wants to break that, that um, stereotype, if you like, and bring people to realise that I think pretty much we all need therapy <laughs> but he did say and that's that's me not him but he was saying the importance of of connection of communication of turning inward of uh, acknowledging our, our griefs and our traumas and making space for them which is truly amazing because it takes a hell of a lot of work for anyone to to do that kind of work and it doesn't matter how much money you've got or where you are in the world although he did say that environment is something he's been blessed with and he can't think of how how much harder it is for people who haven't got that but it really showed him his humanness um, and his he isn't fearless but his, his ab ability to face fears courageously and keep coming out of it now as you know the, the talk was about grief 
we've been talking about all the different aspects of it. Now, you don't, people don't always associate grief with trauma. They just think grief is someone dies. They don't think that grief is from not being, not receiving like affection as a child or they don't think grief is what's caused after you lose a part of you um, after going to war or when you disconnect from members of your family or you change your job or your the area you move in you, you know you move house or whatever or you get married and people forget that grief is all <laughs> all of everything grief is the any time we have a loss of something that's familiar we'll have a grieving process and depending on how resilient that we are uh, and how much stuff that we've already been able to process depends on how long it'll take to process the current level of grief and some people don't get to process the next level of grief until they process the last level of grief and they can be a fair bit of people grieving or things to be grieving that they're grieving for behind uh, where they're at and they they agreed that the grieving process itself was so essential and harry had mentioned that in africa the he'd witnessed people families grieving for days really purging really letting the grief out and letting go and really allowing all of it and he said the difference in that between the people that didn't talk about it was immense and he said it's they said it was a human experience and it is it is part of grieving is part of the human experience it's a part of life it, it, you know and this i mean they say don't they that when you have no attachments you'll no longer grieve well you need to get to one heck of a state of self-awareness and awareness um, to be able to drop any attachment to anything and not be affected by a loss of something in a healthy way rather than disassociate with it and have it suppressed and turn into depression or some kind of illness and as Gabor said his friend had said I've forgotten who it was who said it but it's one of the teachers at NICAM uh, you shall be saved in an ocean of tears and it's so true you have to feel to heal so you have to let it out you have to cry you have to be happy you have to be sad you have to allow the the waves of one emotion and another emotion you have to allow the processing of everything that comes up and, and passes through you can't just sit with the good shit you know <laughs> or concentrating on the good stuff because you're suppressing the rest so you've got to make space for it all. Yeah, when we grieve, it can be from a trauma, at which point we lose the capacity to feel and disconnect and suppress our feelings. And the more we allow grief, the more we can feel anything else. So you know how we disconnect and we can feel numb. When we start allowing grief, to be and we start allowing ourselves to process things and giving it time and space the more that the other feelings will get space to join in too and to finish off they'd said the importance um, of conversation and communications needed less of the us and them less of the separateness because it's helpful to go back to what's wrong and find solutions and grow from that, but not relive what's happened. 
and I, I fully believe that because you don't have to relive your traumas because reliving your traumas just re up, it, it reactivates all your sympathetic nervous system and you end up in a state you know it puts your body through the same chemical experiences as what it went back at the time it's it's like rubbing an old wound you're still going to get some pain especially if it's not healed and when we have a wound that wound itself may be painful but the area around the wound is numb and we need that numbness to a uh, and that to allow the the healing to be and to heal <laughs> you know that we need to be a la allowing of the the part of us that has the no feeling so we can slowly get together and find our feelings and find a way to feel our way forward into a healthier future so with that i'm going to leave on two notes gabor's legacy he said he wants people to be free And Harry, he said his legacy was to help people to not be controlled by fear or allow fear to conquer you. So, two incredibly strong, courageous guys and an amazing, amazing conversation. Um, lots of grist for the mill. Really are serving humanity in the way that they're encouraging people to talk, the, the, the sharing truth, and they're helping people go from where they're at now to a whole different way of being. This is what we need. This is what we need to move forward and find a way to live life again in our the way that we were supposed to to be the the way that we're supposed to live that's authentically and live in our truth as we move forward into the future anyway well take care and uh, Remember, I'm only a message away. Big loves.